So at this point, I'm um, really excited to have Janan Elhavnawi and Sam Drogi here with us to talk about um, some of those ways that we can make a difference for bumblebees, the programs that we can all use to access uh, uh, or to uh, document bumblebees in yards, gardens, parks, and natural areas, uh, and what plants they're on. Uh, Janan is a, a undergraduate student studying biology with a minor in um, entomology and sustainability. And she's also the survey coordinator for the USGS Bumblebee Survey that we're gonna learn more about. And the wonderful Sam Drogi, who is an um, incredible bee biologist, uh, manages so many different resources that he provides ready, ready, ready access to for those of us who are giving programs, pulling um, information together. He has all these images, the very handy bee manual, so many videos that he's done on uh, bee identification. I've tried to access a lot of those or, or put, make a repository for those on our Bumblebee short course website. So um, just really appreciate all that Sam does to build community in the bee world, um, to pull people together and to share um, his many resources. So Sam and Janan, I'm going to pass the, uh, the uh, podium over to you. I should unmute. Thanks, okay, Denise. I can hear you. All right, good. And uh, Denise, I, you know, you feature us very well. I have to say that your series is just absolutely fabulous. You have, first of all, you have a wonderful speaking voice and people in the chat should, you know, praise you up because, you know, you're the person that makes this work. I really love hearing you and you do, you, you know, you should do this professionally beyond the uh, B world. So I think we should just acknowledge you as a big component of all the series, which I listened to um, eventually all the uh, talks that you put together. So thank, thank you, you for doing that. Thank you. And um, I also say that, yeah, things like the Handy Bee Manual, Discover Life Guides and things we're always working on. And now we have a, um, a group of people. We have Claire Mafia in our lab and other folks who are, are circulating through. So it's very much a group effort. So um, expect a new version of the Handy Bee Manual. There's lots of new things to talk about there. But today, bumblebees, and this is new ventures for us too, working more specifically with bumblebees and very much our lab's new ventures, which is bee plant relationships. So what we're talk about today, we're going to speak about the general status of bees in the East. So um, I know there's a, a larger audience here, but I'm going to focus on the Eastern um, half of the continent, including Canada. We're going to then talk about what's important for saving bumblebees. Hint, it's all about plants. And then we're going to talk about a need for collecting more information about that bumblebee plant relationship, which is not very well documented other than, you know, we know that they have pictures of, of different bumblebees on these plants. So we'll talk about that. Janan's going to talk about that as a program. And the neat thing is that there's really two neat things. Well, there's many neat things, but the neatest thing is that this is something everyone can participate in. There's not a high bar in terms of like what you bring to this program. Like we don't ask you to know all the different kinds of species of bumblebees uh, or all the technical parts that you learned about over the last few weeks. We're asking you just to initially be able to discriminate carpenter bees and bumblebees. Most of you already know this, and we'll tell you again how to do that. There's additional things, and I don't want to give away Janan's talk here, but um, so I'm going to stop with that, let her talk about that later. And then I'm also going to say, this is not a monitoring program. This is a data gathering program on plant bee relationships, and it will have immediate use. So we're, it's not like, well, in 10 years, we'll tell you about how the trends of bumblebees are doing. So with that, let me go to the slides and we will go, go to the talk, not my email. Uh, do I do that button? There we go. All right, and now I'll try and make this full screen. This first slide should be replicated at the end. <clears throat> contact information. All the pictures here are public domain. You can grab them, download them, do whatever you want with them. Don't even ask us because we're going to say yes. You can follow us in various social media platforms where we go into detail about some of the really cool natural history things, which we're not going to have time for today. And you can contact us for more information. And we'll have contact for Janan's program here 
in the course of this talk too. So now this is kind of laying the groundwork. I need you to really think about these kinds of things. So we live in an environment and a location, I'm using Maryland as an example, goes for Ohio or anywhere else in the world that is as complex, as evolved, as um, you know, integrated among all kinds of plant and animal communities as anywhere else in the world. So we sometimes, we often diminish our own home territory, but it's as comp these relationships are as complex as in the Amazon and the Arctic um, in the African savannas, all those kinds of things. So first of all, we have to think that we have this some responsibility now for maintaining our home places. It's not all about like, well, the problems are elsewhere in the world. No, these places need to be preserved. Bumblebees are one component of that. And there's gonna be trickle down in helping bumblebees for um, the region as a whole. And again, there's this plant bee relationship that's a reflection of many kinds of plant um, interactions with many other kinds of insect groups, butterflies and other kinds of things. And um, uh, doing things for that plant group, we're gonna emphasize the bumblebee component, but is also gonna be very helpful for many other things. I'll also point out that, well, I'll point out, I'll ask you this, okay, so, Think about where you live, and we'll have a little think more thinking about that in a second. But I also think about where you go for walks, um, when you drive to work or drive anywhere. Think about, and I want you to start observing what you're seeing. So you'll probably go by woodlots and woods, and you'll probably go by roadsides and look to see. So most of that's going to be green because things are greening up, green and brown, right? Where's the color? The color of flowers. And remember, this is what is always going to be bumblebee food and all bee food. So if there's no color in those woods, there are no flowers essentially. And if there are no flowers, there are no bumblebees. Uh, there are always some flowers somewhere sneaking around, but um, the solution is um, going to be visible to you, which is we need to get more flowers into these environments. So a lot of these are degraded in a way, you know, they were, um, something like uh, an old field, they, they start recovering, that biodiversity has leaked out or we've simplified it by spraying or mowing and things like that. So your job is to add color, i.e. flowers, to a lot of these environments. And we will begin to flesh out some of the reasons why, but it's, it's basically, you know, it's on you. Here's your, your responsibility, your call. And what have we done with all this biodiversity as a culture, as a community? We've taken this really complex, as complex as anywhere in the world environment, and here's, here's the, our, the average solution, right? So you guys are in the pocket of biodiversity and things, but think about this. These are places that have no real benefit to the environment. They may be even negative compared to to parking lots because you're not only sheeting water off, you're sheeting all the chemicals that are in there too. I don't need to preach to you, I'm preaching to the choir here, but these are also opportunities. So these same environments can be moved back into usable, wonderful, biodiverse kinds of places by increments or in sometimes wholesale, depending on where you live. So I'm, on, I'm gonna step off my, uh, uh, my, uh, uh, what is it? My talking box. What's the right word for that? The, what is it, Janan? What the is soap it? Box. It's soapbox. Soap box. Got it. I'm all, down off the soapbox. Who even knows what a soapbox is? So um, this is the point again, when we're saving bees, saving bumblebees, where it's about saving pollen, right? So we want more pollen. We want for our, more flowers in the environment. So I'm going to now do a brief jaunt through some databases that you guys know and can participate in. So iNaturalist, a lot of you are on iNaturalist and contribute pictures probably of bumblebees. So here's a big chunk of recent data. Um, so uh, there's one thing you can do, take more of these pictures. It gives us some idea of status. We don't really have a national bumblebee survey program. So these are surrogates, incomplete though they are, they're at least giving us some portrait of what kinds of bumblebees are out there. And then old data, 
um, we'll call this museum data largely prior to iNaturalist um, ends up in a global database, uh, global, global database system called GBIF. And um, it's mostly harboring information that has been scraped out of um, museums over many, many years. So we're gonna compare those two. Um, there are some issues here. So on the positive side, there's thousands of records, okay, for bumblebees in both these data sets. They roughly cover the same distributions, um, biased though they may be in some cases geographically. There are many people involved. So it's not like, oh, this one person has really you know, skewed the data in some way. Lots of different people doing lots of different things. The beauty of averages are that um, that smooths out a lot of differences. And there are many collection events. So people have gone out many, 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 many different times. And that also helps smooth out some of these sampling issues. So I'm just saying these are imperfect data sets, but there's so much of them we can do a little bit in terms of looking for and hunting down big scale changes in bumblebee populations. So here are some of the problems. We won't dwell on them. I'm just you know stating what for some of you might be obvious. So it undercounts things that are away from data centers. People live in cities. They don't live so much in rural areas. So therefore there is more data in cities. Um, and there are differences, great differences in why bumblebees are collected. iNaturalist, we have people who are taking pictures and they are enthusiastic and they're taking pictures of pretty much anything sometimes with some bias towards the prettier bumblebees perhaps. Um, and the museum people, they are all about rare things. So every rare bumblebee was kept. And a lot of the non-rare bumblebees were discarded or never collected to begin with. So they're a little bit biased towards these rare things. So, but it's good because they really, um, it is a good way of saying that there were a lot or a little of these, these more rare kinds of things. And um, so we have common bumblebees emphasized by iNaturalist and rare bumblebees emphasized by the older data. So we have to be aware of that when we start looking at things. We also don't have really good information about these bo uh, boreal and polar uh, bumblebee populations. So there are lots of bumblebees in the Arctic. It's the kind of basically the biggest bee community up there for lots of cool and interesting reasons, but because there's no one up there looking at this, we don't have much information. So we're gonna skip this group um, in terms of talking about things. And now we're gonna go to Northern bumblebees. So <clears throat> this would come down some of these species are within Ohio. I'm grouping things in convenience. So the bulk of the distribution of northern bumblebees are southern Canada, northern US. And the red ones that you see here, sorry that, that I didn't use common names. I just, I have a block against most of those. So if people in the chat want to put in common names for some of these things, that would be great. The red ones are nest parasites of bumble, other bumblebees. So they're uh, taking over, so to speak, the nests of the other species. They are automatically rare, right? You can't support a system where the, the, the parasitic bee is more common. And um, they, they have a very different lifestyle that takes some thinking about. So they're automatically rare. I'll point out Bombus ashtoni is sometimes called Bombus bohemicus and Bombus fernaldi is sometimes called something else, which I don't remember based on molecular things, we follow what are essentially still the old naming conventions. Um, and the E's, little E's, those are bumblebee species that are somehow have been um, involved in the Endangered Species um, Act uh, assessments. So Aphanis is our rusty patch bumblebee, which is endangered, and the others are have been evaluated or are going to be evaluated. So they're already documented as uh, being in trouble. If we look at these Northern bumblebees, a couple things to see. So this orientation, iNaturalist numbers here. Um, and this is the old data. So this is after World War II data, 1950 to 2000. And here's basically World War II and earlier data. <coughs> and you can see by the totals down here, these are quite different. So we're going to work with proportions because these are not comparable um, in terms of the actual numbers. And just a couple things to point out. One is look at this Bombus Ashtoni number here for iNaturalist in the recent number of years, really low. Okay, so it meets that sort of notion of maybe we got a problem here with this particular species. And you can see, even though 
um, in, in these other sets that they're quite, uh, quite a bit higher in terms of overall numbers. Um, proportionally, it shifts a bit when you start looking at proportions. And here in the post-World War II um, data, older data, you can see Bombus terricola, which is another species that was involved in um, an assessment, but deigned to be not in an, an endangered category, ha was very high numbers in comparison here to the more recent stuff. So we need to do proportions to uh, really speak a little bit, at least a little bit accurately to correct for the problem of different sample sizes. Here, light blue means these are differences that are a positive in the positive way, so increases, and the peach color means decreases. And we have three categories of comparisons. We have the current, and by that I would mean iNaturalist, with the post-World War II. We have pre-World War II and post-World War II. All that would be basic museum data collected in a relatively similar way. And then we have the iNaturalist and the pre-World War II data. There's a lot going on, so I'm just emphasizing a few changes. Bombus ternarius, what's the common name of that? It's the one with all the red on its butt, very northern, and it turns out has really shifted towards the common end of the spectrum. So here we have 22% um, increases. Belted. Orange what? Belted. Orange belted. Not rusty patched, but orange belted uh, bumblebee. And um, so it's in apparently very good shape. Also super attractive to take a picture of. So maybe there's a little more bias to collecting that way. Um, but we know it's on the positive up. On the negative, we see that our friend Bombus terricula, uh, which was in that um, assessment of endangered species, but deigned to still be stable enough to be range. It has really tanked in the east. So it's down 17% compared to right after World War II. And prior to World War II, we're down 15%. So basically, in both the comparisons of the old data, there's a lot fewer of them apparently now than before. If we look at Bombus affinis, it's really not hugely different, right, than some of these other categories. It's showing negativity, so 9% drop, 3% uh, proportional drop here with uh, pre-World War II. But you know, the thing is with iNaturalist, everyone is trying to take pictures of Bombus affinis. So there's probably an overemphasis of that, but still it's showing the decline in the statuses. As we know from more detailed, more sophisticated analyses, it's basically retracted from almost all of its range, except for two populations. So um, mid-latitude bees, more in the pocket of Ohio and a lot of the mid-Atlantic states here, smaller number because the species decrease as you go south. One um, species of um, nest parasite, Bombus citrinus, um, and then a bunch of friends that we uh, see as relatively common. Um, not a huge number of patterns here, but a lot of data. Look at all these numbers down here, particularly iNaturalist, over 100,000 um, recordings in just the last few years, um, and that's gonna increase. And if we look at the changes we see, Again, like Ternarius, we have Bombus impatiens, which I think is the Eastern bumblebee. Is that right, Eastern bumblebee? Um, and um, anyway, it's our most common one. Most people are familiar with it. Way up compared to the museum information. Some of that's bias, like people just threw out a lot of these um, Bombus impatiens specimens in the old days, but also an indication of at least stability, if not increasing in proportion compared to others. Um, if we look at a lot of the other patterns, there's not a huge lot of differences between the old and the new data in terms of changes in proportions. Mostly we're just seeing more impatience as the big change factor here. Now when we get to southern bumblebees, so the weight of the distribution of these species is way to the south. I didn't mark this, but Bombus pennsylvanicus, American bumblebee, is something that's involved now with a proposal to um, be provided with a threatened or an endangered status. Um, and it has retracted from certain parts of its northern range is the most apparent um, change in that population. Um, Fraternus, the southern bumblebee, I think that's his name is, and Bombus variabilis is the, um, this group's um, nest parasite. So it's, um, let's see what some data show here. So a couple things, first of all, 
there are no records of Bombus variabilis um, since I think the last one might have been, we had a record in Maryland in the 70s, but I think 80s, maybe 90s possibly, but really it's, it's pretty much disappeared. Really problematic, also difficult to study, right? It was rare to begin with. Now it's like, how do you find it is a problem, interesting problem that we have. So taking more pictures, still a good idea. Maybe one will show up. Um, hopefully one will show up, hard to manage. Bombus pennsylvanicus though, still large numbers. Look here at iNaturalist, 16,000. Um, and pretty much in comparison to that. So at least in the bulk of its range, which is to the south, there still seems to be quite a bit of um, Bombus pennsylvanicus. In fact, weirdly compared to why it was, um, uh, why they ask for endangered species status, it is um, increasing kind of across the board here in these different comparisons, at least a little bit. And the other species have declined in terms of their proportional visibility, particularly Bombus variabilis, like zero is zero um, in, in that kind of system. So um, less evidence that Bombus pennsylvanicus is probably something that we need to be super concerned about, but it gives you an idea that things change up and down. We have a couple species that were really problematic, Aphinus and um, uh, variabilis, and a couple that we have big question marks on, and the rest just seem to be moving relatively um, around. So the most common species are it's pretty stable list here with some members down below going off and then coming back on the list. But um, we still have many of the species. How absolute numbers, you know, number of bumblebees per acre, pretty, there is some weird evidence. It's very difficult because we don't have this monitoring stuff that the, the density of bumblebees has gone down. We can all tell stories about how common they were on our, in our childhood and we stepped on them in the lawns and got stung. It's hard to say, but there is some evidence that they were perhaps a whole lot more common density-wise. Species-wise, some problems, a lot are still you know, in our pocket. We can do things with them. Back again now, diversity of native plants equals diversity of native bees. So we're remembering that in the big picture across all bee species, and we're gonna ask questions about, is that true for a generalist like bumblebees? So remember bumblebees have to be out all year long. They have to use a lot of different plant uh, sources for nectar and importantly for pollen, which is more restrictive to bees than nectar is. So they're pickier about the pollen than they are about the nectar. And since their colony is year long, more or less in the season, there has to be some choosing of a broad list of plants that are good. But it turns out, as Janan will talk about, you know, it, look, it turns out they're a little more picky than we realize in which plants they're going to choose. And some are like, no, we're not going to, we're not, we're not using that yarrow anywhere, that kind of thing. So Big picture, about 4,000 different species. Um, if we look at an individual state in the east, you know, there's, it's gonna be around four to 500 species. And most of our yards have access to all the species diversity, whether they're there or not depends on our uh, planting list. Uh, most of you again know the story, honeybees not native to the continent. Um, they are a very poor model for thinking about all of our native bees, including bumblebees. They're so radically different that if mostly what you know about bees is what you know about honeybees, you know, because culturally that's something that we, we do know quite a bit about. Well, you need to forget all of that and start learning about some other things because none of that honey, waggle dance, comb, uh, you know, barb sting, allergic reactions is present within our native groups, including bumblebees. So um, just, just pointing out that the honeybee model is usually applied when we have the average person wants to begin to think about as their framework and we need to move that framework away and replace it with different details. So um, one of them stinging. So in general, when you say, oh, we wanna promote flowers, sometimes people say, well, we really don't want any more bees around. We don't wanna be stung. So the native species are not a stinging issue. Flowers are not a stinging issue. You can, if you grab a bee, perhaps be stung, but they don't defend floral resources. So you're not creating community um, stinging issues by 
bringing things in. And plus, if you're mostly working with natives, you're not going to send anyone's little darling to the hospital either. So um, most are single, most of the bee species, I'm just giving you general information out, single moms nesting in the ground um, that are gonna use these same floral resources as bumblebees. Bumblebees, um, you might think because they're a little more willing to defend their nests, but not much. I've dug them up out of my garden and it's like, oh, there's a bumblebee nest that I've just exposed and not been stung but you can also still get stung because Bombus pennsylvanicus, for example, is notoriously cranky. Um, if you mess with its nest, it's going to you know, give you a sharp kiss, um, but we're not gonna be allergic to them. So that's the good part um, of a possible stinging issue. And it's always a nest thing, right? Stings happen around nests, not elsewhere, unless you're messing with the bee, like trying to catch it in your hand. Why would you do that? Unless you're a child, <laughs> but, we know that we know how that works, having been a parent. So most bee species, particularly the um, solitary, use pollen only from a few plant species. Even the relative generalist species are still quite picky. You know that Rolodex of plants that I'm going to call on for a bee species is pretty small compared to the larger 4,000 species that are available to be called on. Bumblebees, as a hint here, also have a relatively small Rolodex, maybe a little bit bigger because they have to go throughout the whole year compared to others. Um, when we just talk about specialist bees, so these are not bumblebees, but these are a lot of these other solitary bees, often up to 30 to 40% of the total population of bees in a region are highly specialized. You get all kinds of really interesting things. Like here is just, we're not gonna talk about them, but here's a list of things that have bees that are entirely or, or primarily focused on gathering pollen just from those plants. It's different than you would think sometimes. And you know, one of those cool things about being a bee, bee biologist is discovering and looking at those things. So again, the stinging thing, about 25% of all the females who are the only ones who have stings can't even sting you know, put that sting through your skin. So just really emphasizing, not a stinging thing. So, and emphasizing it's about saving native plants and native um, and planting them. So that's the solution. And the, we emphasize native, not because bees aren't using, and you'll see particularly with bumblebees, there is a use and sometimes quite a high use at certain times of year of non-native plants, particularly in the spring, a lot of these female bumblebees are tanking up on the nectars of gill over the ground, purple dead nettle, uh, bay, uh, barberry, and other aliens. And so that's something we have to think about in terms of our strategies for helping out bumblebees. But for, the, for most bee species and most bee species conservation, it's the native plants that are the anchor. So, and the reason is that the generalist bees often will play around with the use of uh, non-native plants and um, non-native plants often provide nectar, which is a generalist sort of beverage, let's call it, that lots of bees can use. Pollen tends to be much more highly um, uh, specialized, secondary compounds, poisons, uh, repellents, uh, different levels of lipids, fats, and all kinds of phytochemicals that are important for bees. And each bee makes a determination about what on that chemical list it tolerates and is usable, and it's really variable. So that's the importance of the native plants is that sometimes they are the only thing that's providing that for these less common groups, not the crow and sparrow bees. Bumblebees are kind of a crow and sparrow bee, but you know, still. They have so many problems, we tend not to degrade them in that way. So in general, when planting without any other information, native plants, then perennials and shrubs. So most of the specialist bees are um, specializing on a perennial and shrub, not trees and not annuals. And the bumblebees are working that whole entire system. So still emphasizing perennials and shrubs is a good strategy and you don't have to know all the, the shimmering details about things. And also just to point out in terms of a like cocktail party fact about five flowers on average provide enough pollen and nectar to support a baby bee. 
very variable, you know, there's flowers and then there's flowers. One, so another interesting one. So the annual sunflower, one annual sunflower produces enough pollen to support over a hundred bees, just one plant. So, you know, there's your contributions are not in gigantic acreages sometimes. It could be one sunflower plant at a time. So good thing to play with schools and talk to kids about, right? Is here's something you can do, plant a sunflower. Um, lawns, we know, we know this is not a good thing. Um, we may, at the end of this bumblebee study though, say, you know what, in the spring when queens are starting to come out and if you have a lawn in which you allow weeds to grow, which is different from many of uh, North America's wonderful uh, you know, men, I would call, I'll pin it on them, where weeds are not allowed to grow. But weedy things, if you do the no mow at the beginning of the year when the queens are out, there is probably some good possibilities that you are supporting at least the tanking up of nectar using some of these weedy plants for your queens. Otherwise, you know, it's a crow and sparrow thing. Again, you could do better by replacing it with an entire native plant planting. So in general, some things that you can do that are relatively quick. So you have a larger property or you're working with a municipality or a school. Um, a lot of times lawn, 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 woods or a fence row. Nobody is playing at that on those edges. No one plays at the woods lawn edge. No one plays right at the edge of the fence or uses that. So one mower deck, that's what the maintenance people want you to tell them mow that area, but only once a year. That's a lot of good right there. Remember five flowers is all it takes. So there's some little things that you can do. Um, you can look at your backyard and talk about the back, uh, very back section, little pockets here and there, doesn't take many flowers. And then you can also start adding in flowers um, to that environment. You do have, and this is just my warning slide, you know, don't let everything go. Your neighbors will really hate you. And that's not a positive for the environment to have hate spread around for people who like pollinators, right? So if you want a large chunk of your property to be in naturalized habitats with lots of flowers, then you need to keep all the sidewalks edges really trim, the, you know, the edge of the road, your driveway, your house should have traditional bedding plants, the edges of the, your yard with your neighbor's fence should also be well trimmed. It has to look like you did it on purpose and that you did it consciously. And it meets some of the specs. Largely, you can get away with anything after that. So um, there are, these are systems now that are important for, um, in, in terms of big systems that are important for bees within our um, Eastern region and elsewhere too. And these are also really important for bumblebees as a uh, plant community. So your spring woodland flowers. So a lot of these can be um, anything that's blooming in the understory. So in the bottomlands and other places and on the rich slopes in the mountains, you have all these plants at this point right now that are blooming these vernal plants and they're providing tons of pollen and nectar, lots of specialization, a lot of queen use of those environments at this time of year, when it shuts down, they move to the edges, right? Where they're looking for additional product, i.e. pollen to feed their babies throughout the year. So, but in the spring, good woodlands, do, what do they look like in your area? You know, go on your walk, where are you seeing flowers? Many of these uh, woodlands no longer have flowers because of deer and the fact that they've been um, isolated from, uh, the reproduction by other plants that could be moved in. So you could think about transplanting and other augmentation of these areas. Ericaceous shrubs often associated with acidic soils and acidic systems within forests, but also in bogs and edges of plants. Another one that is very important in the spring for bumblebees. And then in the fall, when the queens are produced for the next year, and also still some of the activity for late bumblebee species like impatiens, you have all these composites, goldenrods, sunflowers, asters, things that in some places just come in on their own are the thing that will wrap up. Here's a big happy meal at the end of the year. And now the queens can go to sleep fully fed 
and live off that fat until the following spring. In poor places that are poor quality, a lot of queens die because their fat resources are not sufficient. So you need to think about the 360 here. Um, so quality flowers matter. So we talked about non-natives having mostly generalist bees and that your big box store seed mixes, you can probably realize this. A lot of that's European annual um, attracts bees, but again, it's like bird feeders attract birds, right? So are we doing the conservation of birds a favor by having bird feeders? No, it's zero and negative depending on where you got that seed. And we are emphasizing mostly non-native plants in these kinds of environments by planting um, a lot of the seed mixes now. And then the professional seed mixes is one of our target areas to work with because we think they need to have a more biodiverse mix and something that's a little more, this is what Janan's gonna talk about, a little more um, tight with what bumblebees actually use which versus what's sort of hanging around on the internet. This, which someone could copy and paste please into the chat, is a list of specialized plants. We tell people to usually go to this as a first cut for an area. Again, save the bees, save the bumblebees. It's always about saving the plants and plant diversity. And now I'm gonna to shift to Janan, if I haven't used up all the time. And um, which, well, how much time do we have left? Denise, are we good? You're good, you okay. have a good 35 minutes, Sam. All right, Janan. Janan will power through the rest. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Janan El Hafnawi. I'm an undergrad at UMD, as you heard, and I'm very lucky to be working with Sam on this very fun Ask a Bumblebee survey. Um, I hope that you all participate. I think I'm really excited to have this spot as the last speaker because I have a great action item for everybody to participate in. Um, so before I kind of get into what the survey, how you would complete a survey and why you should complete a survey, first, let's start with what are we trying to answer with this project? So we're trying to figure out which flowers bumblebees actually like the most. And even though bumblebees are generalists, as we've you know discussed over the past couple of weeks, as Sam was mentioning, they don't actually like every flower. And you might think that we already kind of know which flowers that they like, which I that was the impression I had prior to starting this project. But actually most of the existing data on bumblebee floral preference is pretty anecdotal or it won't consider the flowers that are present and bees are ignoring. So then it's not really a super holistic picture of their preference because you know if you have an entire field of black eyed Susans, chances are you'll have a bee visit one of them. But if you have a whole field of bergamot and mountain mint and a couple black eyed Susans, chances are black eyed Susans will not be your top bumblebee flower. So to answer this question, we're really focusing on collecting as much data as we possibly can. And we're trying to do that by keeping the survey really accessible and really just attainable for anybody to do. So all you need to do the survey is a phone and the ability to tell a bumblebee versus a carpenter bee versus other bugs. We do welcome species level IDs for bumblebees if you, you know, are interested in doing that, but we're totally happy to just take bombus species and we're pretty confident that everybody could um, tell a bumblebee from a carpenter bee. And if you can't do that now, we have some resources that we'd be happy to provide. And I'm sure you could learn that in five, 10 minutes. So really anybody can do it. You don't need to know bumblebee species and you don't even need to know your flower species because we use this free app, Seek by iNaturalist, which I'm sure some of you have heard of, um, to identify all our flowers. And that's really great for me because I don't know my flowers, but I can still walk around Sorry about that. that. It might be me. Oh. <laughs> um, and I can, you know, know the species of every single flower that I pass just using this free app, which also has taught me all my wildflowers. Well, not all, but it's been a really great way for me to learn my local flowers and learn about bee preference. And, and we double check later. And yes. So Seek is not 100% accurate. So we do have a floral expert, a botanist to check all of our IDs. Um, and if you do know your floral IDs, you can skip the app and just identify them yourself. So now actually how to complete a survey. Another really fun thing which helps us with the accessibility factor is that you can do the survey anywhere. So when you're picking your area to survey, 
there's no randomized location or anything like that. You could walk wherever you feel like. I like to survey in my backyard. You could go to your favorite botanical garden. The best places are places with high floral diversity so that the bumblebees have a lot of options to pick from. But you could go to you know, a wild area, a suburban area, or even I've gone in DC and walked around you know, the capital. Um, so once you pick your area, you just walk around for 30 minutes. And again, there's no transects or area measurements or anything like that. So it's really user-friendly. Just walk wherever you want. If you happen to see a big patch of flowers somewhere, feel free to leave your trail and go venture over, look for some bees. And as you're walking, you just want to record every single flower you pass. And this is where it's a little different from other surveys, whether or not bees are visiting them. So even if no bees are visiting any of these flowers, you want to record that it was there because that does give us some information about their preference. So as you are walking and recording all the flowers, you do obviously want to tally if there are bumblebees and carpenter bees on these um, plants. And then at the end, you just have to estimate floral abundance and distribution. So we use two different measures for these. For abundance, we use floral rank. Um, this one's pretty straightforward. It just is you want to imagine if you were to take all the blooms from a certain species of plant and to flatten them out to a flat surface, which one would cover the greatest area. So that's really sheer abundance and it's how much, you know, which flower has the greatest area of blooms. For distribution, it gets a little bit less intuitive, but it's still pretty simple. So you just kind of want to imagine if your entire survey area was divided up into like a grid almost of 25 equal area lots, how many of those lots was that flower species present in? We have a little diagram for that. So you can imagine if you started a survey at this dot on the left here, survey start, and you just are walking along this black line of, you know, you see this big patch of thistles, you walk off the trail, go over to the thistles and then walk back to your trail your whole survey area would be what's encased in gray. And this obviously is going to be in your mind, so it's not super, it's really just a rough estimation. But this kind of shows you that thistles, even though they have a high abundance here, they would only be in one lot because it's just this one concentrated patch where the goldenrod, even though it might have a similar abundance to the thistles, it's in a lot of lots. So again, it's not that we really need the exact numbers, but just to kind of get an idea of the abundance and distribution of every flower species. So we did get some pilot results last year. It's not anything that should be used for you know, management or to really draw conclusions from, because as you can see here, we only completed 97 surveys. It was completely a pilot year. Um, most of those surveys were done by Sam and I. We had 12 collectors total, but a couple of them just did a few. So yeah, this was all just last summer trying to finalize the survey so we can be ready to share it with all of you now. And I can get into that data a little bit. So even though it was just the pilot year, you can see this grand total. We did have quite a few bees that we ended up seeing with the 2,689. And we did actually get most of the common bumblebee species in the Northeast, even though it was, you know, just a pilot year. So I'm really excited to see what we'll get once we get everyone involved and we can really increase the scale of this. So these were the flowers that the bumblebees did seem to prefer. Some of this is not so surprising. People might be surprised to see cup plant as number one, which we were kind of surprised mm -hmm. by too. And again, this was all pilot data, so things will probably shift around, but you know, it is interesting to see that cup plant, which is not even technically native in Maryland, was our number one with most of our surveys completed in Maryland. Um, I don't think people will be too surprised to see mountain mint and bergamot at the top there. Goldenrod is also not really a surprise. But yeah, this was our pilot data. And these were some flowers that were not visited at all in these 97 surveys. And again, it's only 97 surveys, so things probably would visit these flowers if you looked forever. But I was very surprised that um, these flea banes and the Queen Anne's lace and yarrow, I was you know, expecting to see some bumblebees because they're sometimes referred to as bumblebee plants, but we saw no visitation in all 97 surveys. 
So moving forward, we are focusing on data in the Northeast currently, but we're hoping to expand to the entire country um, in coming years. And if you are interested in participating and you're not located in the Northeast, we're still happy to take the data. We're just gonna analyze data from the Northeast first. And then whenever we finish that, we can start to move on to other areas. Um, but yeah, we're really hoping to just get a lot of data from this region, and we're hoping to do so by collaborating with groups of master gardeners, naturalists, nature centers, and anyone else. So if you're involved in any groups that you think might be interested in the survey, I would really appreciate if you would just shoot me an email and we can, you know, collaborate. And we're happy to provide data to groups. Um, we can make you a project number and do analysis for your group independently if you would like to know, you know, what bees and what preference you saw just within your master naturalist group, for example. So once we actually collect this data, here's what we're hoping to do with it. We really want to improve the lists of bumblebee plants because as we were saying, we don't actually really know which plants are best to plant to favor bumblebee conservation. So once we get a list of really solid plants that we know that they love based on this data, um, we can share those lists with seed companies and nurseries so we can, you know, promote the planting of these plants across the country. And we can also just develop strategies for how to best plant to favor bumblebees. If you're interested, and I hope that you are because we have such a lovely group of bumblebee fanatics and now experts at the end of this week, you should definitely reach out to bumblebeecount at gmail.com. We don't have a website at the moment, so the only way that you should contact us is through this email, but I will be very excited and respond and send you all the forms and instructions and get you all set up to submit data. And yeah, that's it. Would you like your seat back? No, 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 you stay. All right, so uh, maybe unshare the thing there. Yeah. And Denise will tell us what to do. Okay, awesome, Sam. So, uh, Janan and Sam, there was a question about uh, time of day, and I might have missed that, but it was a question of, uh, sorry, time of day and the data collection for the bumblebee survey. Okay, yeah. Um, generally, we say 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. is the best sort of time of day, but anytime that bumblebees are out, feel free to survey. Um, even though we say 4 p.m., a lot of times there are bees out a little later than that. So yeah, if you see a bumblebee, it is a good time to start surveying. I went all the way through um, April to October last year. I was still finding some bees. Okay. Uh, when you say Northeast, uh, uh, Carrie was wondering what that area is. It is Fish and Wildlife Service Region 5, technically. And then what is, what is that state's list? Well, so we're leaving that vague. <laughs> <laughs> because so, for example, Ohio officially is not in Fish and Wildlife Service Region Five, but Ohio has basically the same bees and the same floral resources as Region Five. So we're not going to um, deny anyone uh, anyone's counts who wants to participate because we'll learn from all of those. So the but our skill set is northeastern. We're negotiating with Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS to bring in some more people who can process the data from elsewhere. So we're emphasizing the Northeast, whatever that means to anybody, including Canada. And then we're um, uh, hoping that the data from elsewhere can be added when there's um, a little more resources. We don't know what the plants are, those kinds of problems. So there's only one Janan we don't want to completely overwhelm her, but we'll take data and then, you know, it becomes permanent at that point. Okay, great. Anja's excited that um, uh, Canada data will be included. Ontario is part of what you're looking for. So that's great. Okay, so, um, okay, so Sam, I've put the links to the specialist bee documents for the East, the Central and the Western US, uh, as well as the host plants. That's all in our, on our website, folks. So once you go back there under links, you'll find all those resources. Let me back up just a little bit, Sam. There, was, uh, there were a few people who wanted to know about crows and sparrows and what you meant by uh, crow and sparrow bees. So I'm using a bird analogy because more people are familiar with birds than they are with 
bees. So when I when I mention crows and sparrows, these are a set of birds that largely don't need our help, right? So when we go into urban areas, there's tons of crows and house sparrows and things like that. When we put in a um, a bird feeder, we not necessarily crows, but we get a lot of sparrows and and a set of birds that are no matter what we do are going to be fine. So we have that same situation with bees, which is that there are sets of bees that actually prefer the kind of disturbed environments, the anthropo anthropogenic, anthropomorphic, no, anthropogenic habitats that we create, lawns, edges, you know, the weedy areas, they don't need our help. So uh, some of the plants that we might want to plant, particularly from, say, if you go to, not to knock completely big box stores, but if you go and they have the wildflower packet, you know, you'll see bachelor buttons, cosmos, zinnias, those get bees on them, but they're basically getting these crow and sparrow bees that don't need our help. The ones that need our help are these ones that are really, and the reason is they're generalists, like they are out all year round, they have multiple generations, and they need to be kind of loosey-goosey, let's call it, about their pollen and nectar. They collect from lots of plants, so to dilute the problems of um, of the poisons and secondary compounds. They're sampling many, let's call it. So the specialists, the ones that are on that list are the ones of conservation concern almost always, which is if you don't have willow, you don't have a bunch of willow bees and, and so on and so forth. So does that give the sort of the context for the comment about crow and sparrow bees? Great, thank you. I, I like crows and sparrows. I don't want to <laughs> say that. Um, there was a question as whether you could put up your plant list again, um, or is that too preliminary to share in a in a um, a long way? People are really interested in your preliminary plant list data. Um, yeah, I mean, do you want us to put it on the screen? Yeah, sure. Yeah, then people can take a screenshot yeah. and yeah, 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 that'd be great. Um, and in the meantime, oh, oh, actually, Denise, sorry, um, the people who are interested email us. We have an entire report where we go through how. What you're looking at is um, a index that's created by taking care of a bunch of problems in, um, you know, where you have high relative abundance and low relative abundance. These are plants that had to occur on at least 10 surveys before they're included. And we don't include the many, many other plants that were only recorded once or twice. So we have an entire report written up that um, recreates these um, lists in way more detail. If people want that, happy to send that out. Well, or do you want to do you want to send it to me, Sam, and I can put it up oh, there too? That's a great idea. Sure, I'll, I'll okay. post it as well, knowing that it's kind of the beta season, right? But I think folks would be really interested in what Yeah, I mean, in the report, we say all that too. So yeah, yeah. yeah that's great. I forgot about that. Cool. Okay, so we'll have that up, folks. Don't worry about that. Um, many people wanted to, you to, they wanted to hear you repeat what you said about sunflowers and how many bees a sunflower will support. Yeah, so there's a, um, a paper, I believe, by Bob Minkley, Robert Minkley, who's now at, uh, what is that, RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, I think, mm -hmm. in New York. And he has worked on different uh, calculations of bee use and pollen relationships kinds of things, which we need more of. And he, um, from his data, he calculated that one, so he was mostly working with, I think, um, uh, a bee group, I don't know which one, uh, Nomia. Um, so Nomia is a, a pearly banded bee from out west. It's about the size of a honeybee though. And um, he calculated that the enough, so let's back up. A sunflower head is actually comprised of many, many tiny flowers. So each seed is basically being created by a tiny little flower. And if you look at a sunflower, it's basically blooming these little mini flowers for many days, right? So they, these little rings that people will see um, so it's actually a quite a good long-term food source, but if you actually look at the amount of pollen, it's huge. And if you then do the calculation of how much pollen is needed to produce a baby bee, it's around a hundred for one, you know, on all, all kinds of averages. So one sunflower, annual sunflower head can feed 
a hundred, at least the pollen component, a hundred baby bees. So don't forget, bees are, um, they don't generate their own heat, they're exothermic. So we, by contrast, you know, we have this 98.5 or whatever it is, um, heater system that we're constantly maintaining. We have to, we have to use energy, we have to provide food and, and do that. And we as vertebrates, for whatever reason, we're incredibly inefficient. You know, most of our food goes in and 95% of that energy goes back out. Um, and insects are way more efficient, they're a lot smaller, and they don't have that internal heating system, so they don't need much energy. So it turns out when you start playing around with those numbers, a average acre, this is back of the envelope, average acre in the mid-Atlantic is pumping out about 26,000 bees per year just with existing resources. Now, you guys can do better, right? Just do your little sunflower calculation. What if you had your whole backyard with sunflowers? Not necessarily, maybe the optimal for the, uh, you know, supporting all the bumblebees or, or bees in general, but it's a, that's a lot. There's a lot of bees would be supported by that. And I should also point out that sunflowers, which include the annual sunflower, but also the perennials have a whole series of specialist bees that only go to Helianthus. Okay, great. Um, many uh, questions came into the Q&A box about your statement that uh, there are no allergies to native bees, to native bee stings. So can you elaborate? And um, people want to be able to share that in talks and right. hear more about that. Yep. So um, if you look at allergic reactions, um, you'll see that the pattern is colonial aculeate, so stinging insects. So we have allergic reactions to honeybees. We have allergic reactions to hornets, paper wasps, yellow jackets, and probably some of the ants. I just don't know much about them. And why is that? And the answer is the colonial bees and um, wasps, their problem are mammals, right? I've got this gigantic hornet's nest. It's full of yummy grubs. I would just like to go in there and eat them all. But what if I were able to develop a poison that would inject um, humans and other creatures and kill them? That would be great. That's what they've done. It's pretty amazing. And at least it's gonna hurt a heck of a lot. So the other insects um, don't have, so first of all, all the solitary bees, um, their problems are other insects invading their tiny little nests that we would never or a skunk or a raccoon or a bear would never bother with. It's way too small. Their problems are other insects. So their sting and their venom designed to repel and prevent other insects. If they could even sting us, which a lot of them can't, then the sting is usually pretty innocuous or mostly what we're getting is the penetration of the sting itself, not a chemical reaction. Um, the I'll only equivocate on bumblebees a little bit here. So there are no known cases where wild bumblebee colonies have led to an allergic reaction, but there are known cases, and this would be true for even people like who raise grasshoppers, for example. Um, there are known cases where um, these giant warehouses, which people are probably not aware of, uh, um, raise bumblebees in huge volumes that people can develop an allergy to bumblebees in there. But in the wild, there's no known cases of someone getting stung by a bumblebee or any of the other species. But honeybees, that is not the case. You have plenty of, plenty of evidence for um, uh, allergic reactions. Also, most of people know this, but when people say, oh, but when uh, all these bees came out of the ground when I was mowing and stung me, and then you know I had to call 911 because I had allergic reaction to those bees, you know it was yellow jackets, not bees. Great, thank you. Very, uh, very interesting, very um, useful. I don't know, Sam, if you have anything um, collected, do you have a paper or information on that as well? I think there would be interest in, in having you know some documentation. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, it's one of those like negative data, you know, right. there's, I don't know any papers that say 
nobody is known to have an allergic reaction. So that information was pulled from a query. We run a um, uh, roughly 1,200 person um, listserv, which people can join, um, that uh, is just like, let's call it uh, the more nerdy discussions of bees. So it tends to be scientists talking about um, you know, some of these, these kind of details. And um, that query went out, does anyone have or know of a case of allergic reactions? And so that's where I pulled that information. I've not seen it published anywhere, but um, uh, it, it's like that negative data that's hard to come up with. I've never seen a, a publication that talked about an allergic reaction. Okay. So it would be great if someone wanted to do more research, you know, do look through the, the literature on allergic reactions. And if they find anything, I would like to know, but right and it could now, be a, could be a macabre uh, community science project, right? <laughs> I like that idea. Or why don't we get everyone to get stung by a whole bunch of na uh, bumblebees and native bees and just see if anyone dies? <laughs> well, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> I'll say, well, Denise said, this is good. Yeah. I'm going to clip out this that piece of the webinar recording. Janine could also... <laughs> Janine could also start a new program after this one's done. <laughs> Survivors of. <laughs> okay, Sam, um, we've had so many questions in the whole series about queen bumblebees. And so I'm glad that you talked about some of our ephemeral wildflowers and also early season weeds that are important for queens. Uh, Ken also asks, what else can we add to the garden that you've found to be really helpful for those queens that are coming out early in spring? Yeah, well, this is actually one of the most interesting questions, and this is why we really would like to get people to do surveys right now, because this is when the queens are out, is it's not super clear, right? So remember, when a queen comes out, a, uh, in almost all cases, and a little bit fuzzy as to whether they want any pollen at all. So the food for a queen itself is nectar, right? Not pollen. So nectar as a, uh, a food given by plants tends to be relatively free of uh, extra po you know, poisons and all kinds of other extra chemicals. That's not completely true, but in general, more bees can tolerate uh, the nectar of almost any plant than they can to tolerate eating the different kinds of pollens. So when a queen comes out, it's like, where's the nectar? And so uh, it, if it's on a you know, lovely non-native plant, it's like gonna go for that. So what we need is more information about some of these uh, woodland systems. So a general pattern in the East at least appears to be that if in a, a natural kind of system, that these bumblebee queens are mostly hanging out for these early season resources where the flowers are, which in, if you think about it, there's not much blooming in a regular field that's not a weed in the spring. Most of the action is woodland plants of different kinds, everything from, um, so for example, blueberries, other ericaceous shrubs, vernal plants, the things that are like trout lily and spring beauty and, and uh, Virginia bluebell is a dynamite uh, bumblebee plant. Um, and then, and actually easy to grow in the gardens in shade, which a lot of people have. So there's a, a positive one. And then there's a variety of blooming shrub, sub shrub, um, uh, small tree kinds of things on the spectrum. So for example, um, we think of apple trees that's not native species, but crabs are native and they're basically the same thing. It's a generalist system. Um, they're, I call them party plants. So they are also something that could be, if you want straight natives, you could plant also these crabs. So it's a long-winded response to say that we don't really know exactly what the favorites are. Bluebells for sure. Janan and I have been out doing surveys and looking at these things. And we'll have to probably craft together some, you know, uh, thinking about native, non-native kind of resources for people. For example, in most of what we see here this spring in the stuff that we've seen so far is 
a is gill over the ground which has a couple other names but everyone i despise this plant i have to say because it takes over my garden beds all the time but you know it is what most of the action is in my yard on queen bumblebees I just talked with Jamie uh, Strange a couple of days ago, and he said that the first bumblebee he saw, the queen, the first one he saw in Columbus, Ohio, uh, was on uh, purple dead nettle, which is that um, that winter annual in the mint family that turns fields that cast of of purple. Right. And uh, okay. it's it's really actually a nice weed to have if, if you're not too worried about different weeds. It's a it's a nice nectar source. It reseeds itself and it's kind of done early summer. So it's uh, it's something I kind of let go. And it's also in my lawn now. Yeah. So a little story there is uh, we see that, too. It seems to be less attractive. But the difference is, I think that the long face things like Bombus bimaculatus are probably more using the dead purple dead nettles because they have a longer corolla. The, the gill over the ground is a, a little dinky uh, flower that I think is accessible to the short-faced bumblebees too. So, so much to learn. Okay, do you have, um, either of you have a specific opinion about no mo may, whether it's uh, effective or not, or worth uh, more study? Um, so um, I think because of this, uh this notion that there are certain kinds of weeds that live in in weedy lawns let's call it that that could be pretty effective uh, you might want a no mow april in your more southern areas right like right now would be way better than to stop have stopped mowing for example um later in the year you know mo you have to ask what are most of those plants that are in my lawn that went by not mowing might bloom the answer, almost all weeds. Answer to that then is what do they support? And that's mostly crow and sparrow bees, these generalists. Not a bad thing at all, but you know, it's in the big picture, we're not saving the planet with no mo may. Um, we could be though making a significant contribution to getting the queens off the ground, right? So they have to get energy, make that first nest, produce workers. So there's some things to think about there. Um, I think the positives might be to think about it as no mo may for bumblebees. But this is what, what we're about. You know, people who are participating in no mo may should be doing bumblebee surveys so we can see what's, what's happening in that lawn. And, um, you know, you can, like Janan mentioned, you can, I've done highway right-of-ways and places that are really just all weeds. That's still, you know, is teasel better than red clover versus white clover? That's an important question too. We're not saying that, you know, uh, these weedy things should be ignored because they still can be good for bumblebees. Right. There were a couple questions, Sam, about uh, bumblebee watch and whether that data is um, useful. Yeah, so I'll just point out that I use iNaturalist simply out of convenience. Um, it's very symbol to, similar to Bumblebee Watch. Bumblebee Watch is run by the Xerxes Society. Um, it's even more focused. Obviously, it's just bumblebees, not everything. So um, if you are like, which do I participate in? I would do Bumblebee Watch because that data is used by uh, scientists uh, more often, I would say. But if you're already on iNaturalist, then yeah, just take your um, bumblebee pictures Bumblebee Watch is going to encourage you to keep taking lots of bumblebee pictures, whereas iNaturalist isn't necessarily asking you anything. You see what I'm saying? And I think, Sam, isn't that all that data from both places going into GBIF so that researchers can access whether it's from iNaturalist or Bumblebee yeah. Watch? So I don't know about um, Bumblebee Watch, um, but I do know that iNaturalist data gets, once it, so there's different criteria for inclusion once it reaches what's called research grade which is like a couple people vouch for it being that species it moves over to gbif or they move it periodically to gbif um, too so yeah there's a lot of these things are all uh interdigitated great uh, and then and victoria asked if there's a particular project on iNaturalist that that needs to be tagged I'm not sure. 
could be. I think it'll, yeah, I think it'll just be accessible. You make that observation and, and oh, people can yeah. filter out the location and, right. Right, so it, when it goes to GBIF, we just use the GBIF filter. Um, in iNaturalist, you can filter the data and get it in lots of different ways. So both are great in terms of data sharing. Bumblebee Watch probably is uh, good. They might just send you all the data. I don't know if you can get it from the site. Okay. Uh, Mary Jo asks uh, if there's information somewhere about, or your op opinions about relocating a bumblebee colony. Uh, people come in, call in from the public, have bumblebees and want the colony to be moved perhaps? Um, I don't, don't have much. I've heard people do that, but I don't know. I can't give you any advice on how often, how well that works and what, how you should do it. Ask Jamie. I did notice in the Humble Bee, so that 1912 book that Hollis referred to last week, that there's a whole section in there on finding the queen. I'm not advocating us to find the queen and re, re, you know, relocate colonies, but there is a, information out there on how um, that's done. And I think some of the Minnesota details, too, talk about that, um, mm -hmm. about um, a relocating. Yeah. In the scheme of things, it probably doesn't matter that much, except to those bumblebees, and it's a good education opportunity too. So uh, there's a question about carpenter bees. I have a lot of them. Does their presence discourage bumblebees or are bumblebees able to hold their own among them? I would say that basically uh, it's, there's not much interaction. You know, you don't really, so, um, Carpenter bees can recognize that, oh, that's not a carpenter bee and they're not going to beat up the bumblebees, whereas they would beat up, they're constantly beating up each other. These are the males. Um, and there might be some floral competition. So note that Janan's survey is surveying carpenter bees and bumblebees. Uh, half of that reason is we want to make sure that people are discriminating the, the carpenter bees. And the other half is that we're interested in carpenter bees too. You know, they, are um, important pollinators and they're maligned. Uh, we're gonna maybe start a bumblebee, I mean, a carpenter bee support group or something, but um, they're very cool. And so we, you know, we have at the bee lab, we have tons of old pieces of, of lumber from buildings that were being torn down and we're chock-a-block full of carpenter bees. Our middle, our, our, I should also say our building is made of metal. So <laughs> no problem there. I have a friend whose high tunnel collapsed because of carpenter bee damage. She saw them around a lot, but didn't think about them being, you know, really doing a lot of damage in the, uh, in the structural wood. And then the wind came. So. <laughs> oh, blame the carpenter bee. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> Better than the carpenter. I think it was her husband. There we go. <laughs> so there was a question about purple flowers and uh, what is it about bumblebees and, and blue purple flowers? Do we know? Um, don't know, don't know, but you're right. That does seem like um, that's a theme. And guess what? We'll have a bunch of data and people can do a flower color analysis. And that would be cool. I hadn't even thought about that. Awesome. Well, Janine and Sam, thank you so much for spending the time with us here and, and teaching us about your work. I think you probably, Janine, are going to have a ton of um, emails uh, to get started on this project. And Sam, hopefully lots of lots of data. And again, thank you for both of you for coming and for the work that you do to help us learn more about bumblebee conservation and all those resources you share. Um, really appreciate all of your time and effort. And thanks, everybody, for, for coming, for being with us. And um, remember to take a minute or two on the evaluation and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thanks, Denise. Thank you so much. Hope, thanks. For, more, hope for more series from you guys.